Hi, today I'm here with Scott Ambler. How are you today, Scott? I'm great. How about yourself, Tony? Oh, fantastic. And Scott's joining us all the way from Canada, where it's freezing cold, whereas I'm sitting in Brisbane, where it's uh, hot. So we've got the two, the, uh, the two ends of the continuum. Um, Scott, I think it'd be really good for you to introduce yourself. As I was saying to you earlier in the, uh, before we got together, I don't like introducing people and people have asked me a little bit about that because I've seen a few of the casts. My reason around that is having been around Agile for a long time, around 1999, 2000, and Scott's been doing this stuff longer than me. You have a lot of profiles out there and people pull off these things and you squirm a bit in your chair when they say them. So I prefer to give the authors as such. Scott? Yeah, so uh, currently I'm the uh, the vice president and chief scientist for Discipline Agile at uh, PMI. Uh, along with Mark Lines, I am the co-creator of the Discipline Agile Toolkit, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, back in the day, though, early 2000s, I uh, led the development of the Agile modeling method and uh, the Agile data method. So uh, all, all good stuff, uh, both still going strong. You know, Agile modeling has pretty much become mainstream, but... Uh, you know, back in the day, it was it was a radical concept to be talking about, you know, whiteboard sketches and post-it notes on walls and stuff like that. And and people really didn't appreciate um, how different of, a, of an approach to modeling that was. And, you know, now it's it's the mainstream. And actually, we've I think we've, I would argue we've got the different problem where people aren't uh, taking advantage of the, of the modeling tools as well as they could. But, uh, you know, I'm not in the modeling tool business. So that's not my problem. <laughs> but anyways, that's a lot of good stuff out there. Yeah, and I must admit, you know, um, 2000, I came across the modeling and and I was working with a bunch of developers and it was the biggest lightning rod walking into this room and there were sketches on whiteboards and there was post-it notes and there was people standing around them and doing things, whereas, you know, previous to that, it had been all in the cubicles, like like such. So it, was, it, was, it was certainly a, um, a different time to be alive, so to speak, if you like. Um, now, it which is was completely radical. Um, it was it was really and and it was amazing how long it took for people to admit they were doing it. Like, you know, like 20 years ago, it, you know, a lot of people were doing it, but they weren't talking about it at all. And I, I re distinctly remember keynoting at a conference and probably like a modeling conference like 2004, 2005. And I basically I, I tore them a new one uh, because. I was saying, like, because you know, like, I had read their, you know, their uh, their um, uh, conference proceedings and that, and it was all, you know, detailed, nitnoid uh, academic papers. Many of them interesting, but you know, to a modeler, but they, there was like, they weren't really talking about what, what they were doing. So I, I stopped, you know, in the middle of the key, like I like to share data and stuff like that. I stopped in the middle of the keynote, and I said, okay, so how many people here? You know, sketch on the whiteboards. They model on the whiteboards. Almost, almost everybody sticks up their hands. And you know, how many people do use post notes? And, you know, everybody sticks up their hands. Um, and I said, so how many people here? You know, wrote a wrote a paper and you know published it in the proceedings. And most people stick up their hands. And I said, okay, so how many of you um, actually included sketches? It actually talked about sketching and post noting and all that sort of stuff in your paper. Boom! Everybody's hand goes down. Right? I said, and that's why nobody listens to you. Because <laughs> you're not talking about what you're actually doing, um, and so that was a reasonably unpopular keynote. But uh, but hopefully got the point across. And uh, or you know, although I never got invited back for some reason, so maybe not. But uh, you know, you got to stick up for what you believe in. And sometimes that that affects people. Then you've made a difference. So you probably did all right there anyway. Well, oh, yeah. I, I, I totally agree with you, Scott. Because I remember when. when Myself and another gentleman, Craig Smith, who I, I'm pretty sure you know from the Agile Alliance. Um, Craig and I were thrown into a room with a bunch of people, um, some some thought workers and stuff, and 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 we were doing this stuff. But I, 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 you, you just triggered a memory. It's like we were in the the, the darkest, dankest building that organisation had on level seven that used to be an old trading floor. And unbeknown, they gave us that floor because no one wanted it. But it was a perfect setup because it had all the trading discs, so we could co-locate and work together. Yeah. But um, you know, everybody just went, oh, they're doing some strange stuff in there. And people said, what's that strange stuff you're doing in there? And now everybody, you know, just accepts that as, as part. My only regret from that time is I didn't buy shares in 3M. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, really, the <laughs> yeah, the community really has really burned through a lot of post-it notes. It was sort of fun to figure out, you know, somebody just run random numbers and, and figure out how much, how many posts, like, there's got to be, like, Many, many, many football fields of post-it of boxes of post-it notes have been have been uh, used up by the agile folks. Um, yeah, uh, in a number, I bet you. 
totally totally agree all right so let's let's work forward in the journey or, or move in the journey um along comes the different frameworks as we know and, and yeah. you know i started off i started off doing extreme programming um as many did and then learn about scrum and we meshed those and etc cetera, etc cetera. but then along came discipline agile um, do you want to talk a little bit about where it came from before we get into where it's going and what's happened recently? Yeah, definitely. So, so Discipline Agile um, came out of my work and my team's work at IBM. And we were um, working with business partners as well, um, including Mark Lines' company, uh, which was Rup Mentor, or Up, Up UP Mentors at the time. And we were going around the world helping organizations to learn Agile and understand Agile and all that good sort of stuff. And we started noticing a few things. Um, so first we noticed that everybody was doing agile differently. Um, we also noticed that everybody was struggling with it and, and sometimes spending millions of dollars trying to adopt this, this crazy agile and lean stuff. And they, so, so that told us a couple of things. So first the fact that everybody was doing it differently uh, told us that the frameworks really weren't getting the job done. And rightfully so everybody's in, you know, they're unique people in, in unique situations um, facing unique problems. So, you know, these defined prescriptive frameworks really weren't getting the job done, regardless of the marketing rhetoric around them. But we also saw that there was a need for something, right? Because there was this spectacular wastage going on. Um, like, because pe everybody's making the same mistakes and um, struggling with the same basic issues. And I would argue they still are, because there, there's a few blind spots in the Agile community where we really just aren't getting the job done. And there's no end in sight. So, because it's just not, there, some talks are just not sexy. Um, so anyway, and which is okay. So anyway, so we started nice things. So we had these two observations that were, you know, at, appeared to be opposed. Like, you know, the, the fr frameworks weren't getting the job done, but we really need a framework. Uh, so uh, to help, right, help address these problems. So we, it took us a long time to figure this out. Um, and the other thing too, when I joined IBM, uh, I was pretty adamant. I didn't want to create a framework. I was not there to to do that. And because uh, I already had all the arrows in my back, I just didn't need that anymore. Uh, so I thought I'd learn my lesson, but apparently I didn't. So we we, we came up with um, the fun the fundamental concepts behind DA or, or uh, discipline agile delivery at the time. And it was all about choice. So instead of telling what people what to do, instead of prescribing it, um, and most of the frameworks uh, and methods in the Agile world are prescriptive, right? When you have one way of doing things, that's prescriptive, regardless of the marketing rhetoric. So I would I would invite people to to just ignore the marketing rhetoric, look up words in the dictionary or online, you know, depending on where your dictionaries are, and actually you know look at the words as they're being you know look at the words as they're defined, and then you know then you'll start realizing that some of the marketing might be a bit off. Uh, so, anyways. Um, so the prescriptive stuff wasn't get the job done. So instead we give choices. So instead of telling people what to do, we tell them what to think about. And, you know, you really need to be concerned about these sorts of issues when you're dealing with architecture or when you're dealing with changing, you know, stakeholder needs and stuff like that. Um, and then here's some options to address those issues. So you choose the right approach for you in your situation, because I don't know you, I don't know what situation you're in. So it would be inappropriate for me to tell you, oh, here's the best practice for dealing with that, because there are no best practices. Everything's contextual in nature. So what you really want to do is figure out the best way, best approach for you right now in the situation that you face. And then over time, as you learn and as your situation changes, you want to evolve your way of working. So that's the, the fundamental concept behind DA. And we... So we started with Discipline Agile Delivery, which was addressing the issue. So how do we do solution development um, end to end? So it wasn't just software development. Um, you know, we were looking, because it's not software that we're developing. Like this is one of the great myths of the Agile world. It's, you know, we really are trying to deliver solutions. So yes, there's software involved, but there's also hardware, documentation, business process change, organizational change, and all this other good stuff. So we really need to be looking at the overall solution that we're delivering and evolve that appropriately. And in many cases, there's also the issue that sometimes we're still working in projects. So, and regardless of whether or not, whether or not it's a project, you still need to initiate the team. 
So you might want to have your act together on that, right? So, and it's not just this hand waving nonsense. Oh yeah, it's sprint zero, and you know we'll put a few you know post its on the whiteboard, and we're good to go, right? You got to get your team together. You got to do some initial architecture, some initial requirements, initial planning, and so on. Get you know get your you know get uh, your your stakeholders, your customers aligned, reasonably aligned with what you're doing. Um, then you got to build it. Then you got to deliver it. Um, and delivery is is a different animal too. So we explicitly covered that sort of stuff. Um, and we explicitly, you know, work through here's all the aspects of solution delivery, not just the, the stuff that, you know, some people want to certify you in. So how does architecture fit in? How does governance fit in and testing and programming and all these other good things? Because none of the methods were dealing with all of the issues you actually had to deal with. There was a lot of hand waving, right? Everything's the art of the possible, right? So, you know, adopt our framework and then figure the rest out for yourself. And, you know, the rest is very, very difficult. So, but, you know, hand waving, hire our expensive consultants. So th that's what we're going at. So then over, a year, over the years, we um, expanded it to address DevOps at, at the enterprise class. Um, not So not just the classic DevOps, which is good, but also, you know, DevSecOps. So, you know, we're very early days in, you know, asking the question, how does security stuff fit in? Because we were dealing with that on the ground, right? Um, how does the data stuff fit in? We were dealing with that on the ground. There still really isn't a coherent data DevOps story out there. There's a few good vendors and a, a few, you know, here and there. But for the most part, it, it's still it's still magical stuff, right? And if you're not doing data DevOps, you're not really doing DevOps. I'm sorry, you're just not. Um, you know, you're fooling yourself on that one. Um, you know, it's got to be everything that you're delivering. You know, if you want, if you want to say you're doing DevOps, you got to be delivering everything on a regular basis, not just the little cool things you want to deliver. Yeah. So there, there's all all this good sort of stuff going on, and we expanded, um, and it, you know, to the enterprise, and because uh, you know, how do you do uh, business agility? You know, how you know because you know how does the finance group work in an agile manner or lean, agile or lean manner or procurement? or, you know, or, um, you know, uh, HR and other groups. And, and the challenge is that your organizations are complex adaptive systems. So that finance group, they're going to go off and they're going to do their own thing. And they're, you know, they'll improve and, you know, at their own rate, and they've got their own vision, as, as will the HR folks, as will the marketing folks and everybody else. But how do you make it all work together? And when my team has a challenge with another team, right, like, so say, I'm trying to be agile, and the finance people, they're still off doing annual budgeting. Which is pretty normal. normal. Yeah. <laughs> normal. Just, yeah, yeah, which is normal, right? Which is which is a problem everybody's dealing with. Yep. And it's a reasonably simple problem to solve if you know what you're doing. Um, but if you don't, it's a very difficult problem to solve. And you and part of it is you've got to appreciate well, where are the finance people coming from? What are their priorities? What's their mindset? Because it's different than your mindset. And, and different priorities, different mindsets, um, and yet you got to work together. And and it's not only and it's not just well we ins, you know we're agile and we insist on on doing uh, you know uh, time materials funding. We, that's cute, but what about capex? What about this? What about this? What about this? Uh, that are all very important that the finance finance people want. Oh, and by the way, the finance people really don't like time materials for because they shot themselves in the foot years ago on it. So how do you negotiate a coherent? Um, process imp improvement strategy, right? It's not just about failing fast and all that nonsense. It's you've got to, you know, those two teams have got to negotiate what are we, you know, what technique are we going to try to experiment with to see if it works for us? And if you don't have the skills to negotiate that, and that means you need to understand where both those teams are coming from and speak their languages, um, it's a non starter, which is why everybody's still, for the most part, everybody's still struggling with basic agile finance stuff because the agile coaches don't know how to talk to the finance people. And so they get ignored. <laughs> it's really that simple. Um, and so, yeah, so anyway, so in DA, th these are sorts of problems that we're solving. And this is what we train people in, right? Uh, because, and, and, cause from our point of view, it's really all the same sort of stuff, right? It's like, really about understanding what this, you know, understanding what they're trying to achieve, uh, understanding what the issues they have to address because, you know, finance is finance and procurement is procurement and so on. Um, but then an, and understanding the options and then describing the trade-offs of those options, right? So it's not just, oh, this sounds really cool. Let's try this. It's, well, wait a minute, here's this, here's this technique and here are the trade-offs. Here are the advantages, here are the disadvantages because nothing's perfect. No such thing as a best practice. 
Um, it's, you know, it's, you know, what, what are you willing to live with? You know, what benefits will that, will that strategy give you? But, you know, what are you going to take a hit on now as a result? <laughs> so, because you, and you probably want to deal with that doing something else. So, and then how do you combine these, these, these techniques to find the best way of working for you right now? Um, so that's really, so, so DA is really a toolkit to help you to do process improvement, to help you improve your way of working. Um, and it's not just this random failing fast stuff where, because, you know, you know, like one of the, you know, one of the big fads right now in the agile community is to fail fast, which is certainly better than the failing slowly, but it's, you know, there, you know, you, you've basically got people with no real idea what they're doing, taking it, making good gas and failing. And then they take another gas and they fail, another gas and they fail, another gas and they fail. Oh, and then finally they guess right. And it worked out. And, you know, and all the rhetoric, hey, you know, it wasn't really a failure. We At least we learned something. Mm, yeah, but you didn't need to be that stupid about it. Yeah, that's a... Uh, I, I, I have to interject. I have to go with you with that because that's something that I've been on for some time at Fail Fast. You've got to put bounds around it. You've got to actually do it in it. So there's nothing that strikes that fear into the heart of a CEO or a CFO or, or anybody who's charged with the responsibility of their company to say, oh, we're going to fail fast. Yeah. Hell no. Hell no. Hell I'm not paying for that, moron. Yeah. It's like, come on. And it's, yeah. So, and, and it's, and the two, and, and it can still fail, but you know, it's, you don't have to fail as often. Right. So if you've got the humility to understand that you are struggling right now with problems that other people have already solved, you know, thousands of other people have probably solved. And all you, if all you need to do is figure, have the humility to recognize that and say, wait a minute, we don't need to guess. Maybe we could go and look and say, oh, look, there's three different ways that we could potentially solve this. And oh, that one sounds like it'll work best for us because, you know, John over here, you know, has this weird thing. Right. So, you know, so fair enough. Um, and what, what's amazing is that, you know, we, you know, when we, when we train up people in the toolkit, even experienced, uh, very experienced coaches, um, we get the, the, the feedback is always the same. It's like, oh my God, I, I, I couldn't even, I didn't even realize there were solutions to these problems that we've been struggling with now for a long time, let alone multiple choices. <laughs> and you, you know, you've made it so easy. It's like, you know, why, you know, why didn't we know about this? Well, it's because, you know, you were you know, you're, you're certified in some prescriptive framework and they're not going to tell you how to move away from the framework. Why would they? That's crazy. Um, so, so that, anyway, so that's, that's what we're doing in DA. Yeah. I, I, just, I really enjoy that. I just want to pick up on a couple of things and, and, and dig just slightly yeah. deeper in those because there's plenty for us to talk about. Um, firstly, let me just qualify my comments around the fail fast because I can see everybody going ready to shoot me with the arrows. Well, for sure. What I'm saying is not that I'm saying you shouldn't fail fast, but what I'm saying is you should put some bounds around that, do that in a way that's safe for the organization. And too often I see uh, agility used as a as a as an answer to go, oh, we could just fail fast and then we do things we shouldn't do. So that's what I'm saying there. Uh, <laughs> uh, secondly, um I've I've been watching and following DA for quite some time and and uh, you know I've often said to people, if you're gonna you're gonna pick a framework that you want to scale with, the DA would be the one. You know, I'm on record for that, so it's not like fanboying here. The thing <laughs> well, I can if you like, Scott. But yeah, the second yeah. thing, <laughs> the, the second thing I want to pick up on there, yeah, you hit a, you hit the, the nail on the head with the funding and the HR, but there's one in there that you mentioned that I just want to just take a moment. I'm really high on the governance factor. Yeah. And one of the things that you know I've been talking about for some time with one of my um, compatriots is, is governing agility, right, or agile governance, because a lot of the other frameworks who shall remain nameless say, oh, yes, we do agile governance, but they don't actually. They just say we're just going to do agile. So talk to me just a little tad about how you think about governance in, in terms of that within DA. Yeah, definitely. So, so governance strategies are, are baked right in because our philosophy is you are being governed. Um, like it or not, like it, it, there's no question you're being governed. Um, you deserve to be governed well. Now, if that's happening, that's, you know, that's, that's problematic, but <laughs> you deserve to be governed well. Um, on their own, leadership often isn't going to govern well, um, you know, particularly if your organization is reasonably new to Agile, then they more than likely have reasonably traditional governance strategies, which don't really govern traditional approaches well, and they certainly don't govern agile approaches well. So you really need a lean approach to, to governance. 
so good governance is based on motivation and enablement, not on command and control. So I should be doing the mo as a leader, I should be trying to motivate you to do the right thing. And I should be clear what this right thing is, you know, for the organization. Um, and then I should enable you to do it. I should make it as easy as possible for you to do the right thing, you know, through automation, through uh, you know, sometimes making the wrong thing very hard to do and the right thing very easy to do, because I know you're lazy and you're probably going to take the easy path. So there's ways that I can govern uh, for the role. And then as a leader, um, I should be keeping an eye on things. And when I see that you're, you know, you're struggling or getting into trouble, or if you're coming to me for help, then I should be willing to step up. And you know, we we talk a lot about you know, servant leadership in in uh, in agile a lot, but it's really more about host leadership in many ways. But you know, servant leadership has its part. But um, you know, we're sort of not really getting servant leadership in my mind in 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 agile like we, we talk about it and you know from a mindset point of view i think it's a great thing but you know we'll say you know these scrum masters they're going to be servant leaders and they're gonna and they're gonna go and, and solve all you know help the team solve all the problems they've got what a load of crap that is that, like that is just complete nonsense you've got these disempowered people with a couple days of training and you're saying they're going to go off and you know solve all the solve all your team's problems they better be a pretty darn senior people with a lot of good connections in the company who, you know, all sorts of stuff, you know, and they're probably, and those people aren't really scrum masters. So, you know, sorry. Um, so yeah, so it's completely naive, right? But it's wonderful rhetoric and everybody, everybody thinks they're, they're doing it well. And yeah, you can be a servant leader at a small scale, but to really get the job done, you better have really, <laughs> you really better know what you're doing. So you know, and so, you know, and what happens is you've got to work with the people, like the lead, the real leaders in the organization to get the job done. But if they're off, you know, in fantasy land doing traditional governance and doing whatever, you're done. It's just, it's over, right? So you really need to have coherent governance. And it's not sexy. It's not the most interesting topic in the world. But if you, if you don't have good governance at the team level and good governance at the organization level, it, it's basically a non-starter. And um, and this is where, uh, I, you know, this is one of the blind spots of the Agile community. You know, we've got to stop beating up management. We've got to stop um, saying, oh, well, this is an over, this is an evil bureaucratic overhead. Therefore, we're not doing it. Um, like I said, you are being governed. You deserve to be governed well. And if you want to be governed well, you've got to stand up and say, here's how you do governance. Uh, and be able to have coherent conversations around that. Um, and then, you know, coach, you know, then you got to coach leadership and, you know, help mentor them and all that sort of stuff, because it's going to take time. It's part of your overall, uh, you know, agile transformation or adoption or, you know, improvement, whatever you want to call that. Look, I really applaud that. And, and you know, that goes with the things that I myself have been saying for some time. It's about governing the system to work and how you govern that system in the, in the best way possible to allow those decisions to be made in the right way for leadership whilst enabling your people. So in a nutshell, brilliant. Um, I need to ask you the question, uh, and it's on a lot of people's lips, so this is a good opportunity. Why did you move to PMI? What's the driver of that and where are you headed? Yeah, so we we were purchased by them. Uh, you know, the Diff Financial Organization was purchased uh, in August of 2019. i make sure I get the, the years right. Uh, so about two and a half years ago. And uh, we were, you know, they bought us. So, you know, money was obviously part of it. But it was also we needed a partner. Um, we were getting crushed by SAFE. Uh, so, you know, we were being outmarketed, outgunned by them totally. And we, we needed help. Our marketing wasn't very good. <laughs> uh, we still have some issues with marketing. But, uh, you know, certainly, certainly it wasn't very good. And, uh, we, and we needed just investment to you know to flesh out the toolkit and flesh out our offerings and so that's uh, you know that's where we are um we also you know there is a very good opportunity for um just helping the project management community um and helping you know it, and that's not our overall focus but certainly it, it's part of it and um you know to help them become leaders and become uh, you know you know just take on better roles in the organization or just to flesh out their existing role as well and you know, help convert them into a more agile, more lean way of way of working. Um, and it's also been very interesting because the, you know, so PMI 
uh, has a you know a very wide range of uh, of members. So it's not just about software development. So one of the one of the great things. Um, it's really sort of, you know, and we were already on this path anyways, but it's really sort of forced the issue to look at a much wider range of domains because the, the way you approach a construction, like a physical construction effort is very different than a, you know, a virtual software effort. And um, there, and there's, there's a lot of, you know, more overlap than you would think, but there's also some very interesting differences that um, can and should be supported. So anyway, so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's been very good for us. No, that's great. Yeah, and thank you for being so forthright about it. Because I think a lot of people ask that question. Um, I sort of knew what was going on in the background because I'm in those circles. But yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting for people to understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, so, you jump in on that. I, sh I should also point out. So one of the, like from a personal note, one of the great things about PMI is we're a, not, we're a true not-for-profit. And I get measured on enablement. So how many people am I helping is my primary measure. Um, it's not how much money am I bringing in. It's not, you know, you know, are we growing market? Well, market share is a bit of it, but um, certainly, it, but it really is, you know, like, you know, when I talk, you know, when I, you know, I, I report directly to the CEO and his primary interest is, you know, how many, how many enablements, you know, you know, are we doing, you know, are we doing better? Are we, you know, um, what are you doing there? That's really, uh, and that's refreshing, uh, very refreshing. Uh, so, you know, we're not really not in it for the money. Uh, and that's, that's brilliant. And the, the other thing for me that it strikes me is, and you, you, you said it, you said you want, it's an opportunity to help the project management uh, community. And the, there's a thing here with agility that I see is, is that um, project management is sort of in the agile sphere is, is seen as the thing that we shouldn't have or seen as the thing that should disappear. But the reality of reality of big enterprise, big organizations and big programs at work, right? You know, I worked on a $350 million program at work. You are going to need project management in some shape or form, or there yeah. are going to be project managers you're going to walk into. So you need to know how to help them to understand how to work in an agile way. And, you know, the the good project managers that I've worked with that, that have adopted a, and addressed agility uh, have been absolutely brilliant, you know, brilliant people enablers and etc so i applaud i applaud that um yeah. we're getting pmi is about more than just uh project management uh well obviously you know you know we've got da but uh, also uh we have a really interesting uh effort around citizen development so the how do you use, how do the business people use low code no code tools to to build their own apps and uh, now i you know i'm we we interact with them. We're working with them really well. But the thing I really love about that stuff, that's actually where I cut my teeth as a writer about 25, 30 years ago now um, in the in that space. And what's really cool about what they're doing is they're looking at some of the you know not so sexy issues around, well, how do we make this successful? Because it's not just using some cool to, tool and banging out some code. Anybody can do that. Yeah. It's you know how do you make how do you operate and maintain this over time? How do you evolve it over time? How does it fit into your overall infrastructure? How do you how do you choose to make the right architecture decisions? And when do you choose to not do this low code no code stuff because it's not um, the perfect solution for everything, right? And this is what the the citizen development the citizen development effort at PMI is addressing. It's really putting together some lightweight coherent strategies around how do you bring this into your organization because otherwise it's going to crash and burn and it, you know you, you're going to run into those all these organizations where you get this shadow it running again and bad things are going to happen and then of course we're going to you know all this stuff will be created and then dumped on the it people here you go congratulations you know um good luck right and, <laughs> yeah yeah that's, that's, and that's not good that is not fun, good fun. um so anyway, so, so you can be smart about it, is what I'm saying. Oh, no, no, that's good. Yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing that because um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people don't know that. Oh, I did know that about PMI, so I was remiss of me not to mention it. Um, one of the things that I want to ask you, Scott, is, and it would be remiss of me to do so, seeing this is a, rem a podcast about all the remote things. Uh, we're getting close to the end of time, but I really want to address this, so I'm going to stretch a little. <laughs> How are you thinking about this in terms of working in the remote frame or hybrid or distributed? I keep saying those three words because for me, they've all been interchanged over the last two and a half years. You know, we used dis distribution or distributed work for a very long time. And now all of a sudden it became remote because everyone was hiding away. And now it's hybrid because they're mixing everything. H how do you see dad enabling that? Yeah, so um, we, we actually uh, explicitly supported that from the very beginning. 
Um, so, you know, 10 some odd years ago, we like literally baked it in. So our definition of scaling was, you know, not only team size, but it was also geographic distribution. So how do you do, how do you work when, you know, you're a globally distributed team? And, and, you know, back in the day, I, you know, I used to lead studies around what's people, what are people actually doing? So we explicitly built in uh, regulatory compliance strategies into play. Um, how do you deal with complex problems? How do you deal with complex solutions? Um, so we looked at all forms of scaling, not just the large team size stuff that everybody else wanted to deal with. And so we had strategies in from the very beginning um, for remote. And because, like I said, I was running studies and research and I had solid numbers showing that co-located teams was a myth in the Agile community. Like roughly one third of Agile teams, um, you know, several years ago now were co-located. Everything else, every, every other team was like hybrid you know, in some way or fully remote. Um, now, COVID forced the issue. And it was interesting. If you remember like two and a half years ago, the vast majority of Agile coaches would say you can't do Agile doing remote. Yeah. And right. I was pushing back hard on that. I, I was just saying, you know what, that's completely ignorant nonsense. Um, the, the vast majority of teams have a remote component to them to begin with. I would invite you to actually shut your mouth and look around and see what you're doing in the real world, not your fantasy world stuff that everybody wants to, wants to talk about. And then suddenly COVID hits. And then like a month later, everybody is remote. Right? Yep. And then suddenly everybody's coming out the woodworks here. Oh, yeah, remote agile. Yeah, I've been doing that for years. Oh, come on. Right. Come on. And so anyway, so it's, I, you know, it's been a healthy thing that now, you know, reality is hit and we're actually speaking coherently about this. So, yeah, we had we had strategies baked in right from the very beginning, um, because, frankly, uh, my assumption was always because I, I was never brought into the simple, you know, small team in a co-located room taking on a simple problem. I was always brought into wow, they, they're, they've got some really hard problem to solve, like being globally distributed or being in a life critical regulatory situation or, you know, dealing with all this legacy nonsense or, or whatever else. Right. So I never I ever had the, the privilege of working in these trivial situations that everybody wanted to focus on because those were the easy ones to solve. Um, you know, we, you know, from the very beginning, DA focused on you know, here's the reality on the ground being faced by the majority of people. I'm really, I'm really glad you said that. I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to say that. And, and my reason around it was, um, I was drafted into a very, very big program of work, which which was across three different continents, um, multiplicity of teams, multiplicity of time frames, very distributed, right? And um, I leveraged a number of the things because I, I, you know, I was a dyed in the wool agile coach, and it was probably the making of me the five years I spent on that particular program of work that I had to learn to how to do this. And it was like I was learning all over again. And, you know, I gave a talk about it not long after it because it was pretty raw and I called it coaching fails because I made a lot of mistakes Ooh. learning how to do that. And I must say, you know, I did leverage a number of the, the, the DA thoughts, which were baked in and, you know, you, you could see those and they still use them today. So, so I thank you for that. Um, yeah. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. And, and it's, and, and I also did, yeah, I was lucky enough. I was working at IBM at the time and we were by definition taking on hard problems and I'd be going into financial institutions and dealing with these agile teams and going, oh, wait, we can only be 10 people in agile, blah, blah, blah. And I said, really? Because, you know, are you guys using, you know, IBM product X? Oh, of course we are. We are on the company on it. Really? Well, did you know there are 700 person globally distributed agile team? Yeah. What? <laughs> That's not what my coach was telling me. Yeah. Well, I'm here to tell you the truth. Oh, and are, are, are you also using that? Oh, that's a 600 person team, um, you know, spread across three continents. How about that? <laughs> right. So, uh, but yeah, they, they, the, the, the rhetoric in the community was, you know, geared to sell um, simple solutions. It really was that blatant. Yeah. And look, I, I would say to anyone who's listening, do yourself a favor as, as an old saying goes and, and, and have a look at DA. Just, just have a look and have a, yeah, have a think yeah. about it to some of the other scaling frameworks that you might think about or any of the other frameworks you might think about scott we're very close to the end of our time i didn't get to uh, to to address your ad uh, a passion for atari but we'll get to that another time soon yeah. um this is where we do give you a bit of quick pro how can people get involved how can they find you how can they how can they touch base with dad 
Yeah, so easiest thing to do is go to pmi.org slash discipline agile with a hyphen in the between discipline and agile. And you'll you'll hit the DA hub. We got a, a just a boatload of free information. Uh, if you go poking around, we've got something called the DA browser, which will enable you to understand what some of your options are and the choices behind them. So a lot of great stuff there. You know, we're we're really giving away an incredible amount of information for free. Um, and of course, you know, we've got certifications as well and training and all that good sort of stuff. So, um, you know, you probably do, you know, particularly if you're a coach, um, we've got some great, uh, uh, the Dispenagile Coach and the Dispenagile Value Stream Consulting uh, uh, Consultant um, training is just phenomenal. Um, you'll never get anything else, anything anywhere like it um, in the world right now. It's really great stuff. Um, so if you want to up your game and truly get on the improvement path rather than just adopting frameworks, then uh, you know, take a look at some of the, the more senior DA certifications. Brilliant. Scott, thank you again for being on all the remote things. And I can truly say we'll have you back again because I think there's about five or six different subjects we could talk about. Yeah, definitely. And we, we definitely do have to talk about the, uh, the joys of Atari 8-bit computing. Oh, definitely. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Scott. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. My pleasure.